Girls, we are here for you wherever you are. This is the Dare to Ask podcast, episode 11. You are not cancer. It's okay to laugh Mm -hmm. and it's okay to smile. We're not going to let cancer win. I'm Corey Jensen, your host for this Dare to Ask podcast. I'm a mom to a big family and have delivered five babies. And like many women, I try to stay informed about my wellness as well as the health of my kids. We've created a space to have open conversation about what's going on with the woman's body without feeling intimidated in a clinical setting. A place to talk like girlfriends do. A space that dares to ask. We're here to make a connection, be authentic, and really really get to know your provider. Yes, know the person behind the stethoscope. Dare to Ask will be where you hear the questions that we are all curious to know, but just need a space to do it. You've landed on the Dare to Ask podcast, show hosted by Corey Jensen and sponsored by Essentia Health. That cancer diagnosis changes you, but what it should not do is it should not define you. So the journey to practice medicine can be known as early as childhood, or for some, it can be more of a late bloomer in life. This episode's guest had a path to oncology that came later in a career in medicine, where she had already been in a number of different areas in the medical field. And in the most beautiful way, Dr. Joni Beekler Price shares about what got her to the place where she is treating more than just her cancer patients, but that she cares and looks out for their family too. She is so well respected and so loved by her patients and in her department. She's known as the person that has jokes, that makes people laugh and smile. And we get vulnerable and deep. We find out ways that she's able to recharge. We already know that cancer touches so many lives, and we even talk mental health and the importance of that in your wellness journey. Strangely enough, the cancer episode is going to be fun. Let's get to it. What does weekend plans look like for Dr. Doni Beekler? My weekend plans, I'm going to nap. <laughs> I am terrible. (laughs) No, I am so all about the nap. Uh, I feel like I wish I could go back and tell my four year old self that there will be a time in your life that you will really want. You'll want to nap. (laughs) And she'll go baloney. But I I mean, the reality is, is yes, we want naps. They're life. (laughs) Usually I spend like one day of my weekend, you know, catching up. You're getting the groceries, you're doing the laundry, you're paying bills, you're cleaning your house and then church. And then usually on a Sunday, I go in, I volunteer at an animal shelter. You do? Which one? Cat's Cradle. Oh, that's awesome. Downtown. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Is animals would you say a passion of yours? Like, oh yeah. You just like <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anybody who knows me. Oh, she's kind of the oh, the crazy cat lady. I yeah. love that. How many pets do you have? So we have three cats in the house. Mm-hmm. My husband has one in his hangar. Yes. Yeah, that cat works for a living. Let's talk. Do you want me to call you Dr. Beekler Price? No, Beekler. Just Beekler. Yeah. Let me talk to you about your passion and your career. Because how does one find themselves desiring to get into oncology? Yeah, you, you don't. It was a long journey for me. Your reputation is one that so many people say you are just fun to be around. You are very good natured and funny. You like to laugh. You like to make people smile. (laughs) Sometimes you would put that in column A and then try to line that up with oncology. And it doesn't necessarily seem like that would make a whole lot of sense. Most of the people you see on the daily have just received the worst news Mm -hmm. of their lives. Mm -hmm. And you're there to help. Can you describe a little bit how you take a personality like yours with a field like oncology and put them together? So I think when patients come to see me, I think they want about three things. Number one, they want you to know what you're doing. Number two, they want to know that you care. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Number three, they want you to be honest. And that's not always easy, but I always say, you know, I am not going to lie to you. I'm not going to be blowing any sunshine or roses where they don't belong. We are just going to have honest conversations. You be honest with me. I'll be honest with you. Talk to them like they were your sister, your mother, your brother. You know, they want to hear you talk in in normal human terms. Part of that is to get to know them as a person. Mm -hmm. You're not a breast cancer. You're not a prostate cancer. And so as I'm getting to know them and them getting to know me, it's okay to laugh Mm -hmm. and it's okay to smile. We're not going to let cancer win. 
cancer steals so much from us. It, it steals your peace of mind. It steals your hair. It steals your blood counts. It steals your energy, your weight. Sometimes you feel like it steals your identity. We can't let it steal our joy. Yeah. Because when cancer steals your joy, that's when cancer wins. So we can't. Yeah. Not every patient wants to have a smile or a joke. Mm -hmm. um, most of that. them do because it makes them feel human, makes it feel more real and personable. I mean, when their so, doctor is wanting to find out about them and then is able to smile and mm -hmm. induce a smile mm -hmm. back, that is what quote unquote bedside manner is. Yeah. That well, is my, that, that my feeling. My husband of, tells me I'm not as funny as I think I am. Part of this podcast is wanting to be able to do a couple things for women out there. Now, mm -hmm. I, you see both men and women. Yep. You really have a knowledge base and a professional base to help anyone in the oncology and radiology department. Speaking specifically to women, we go to ovarian cancers, we go to breast cancer. Mm -hmm. What is one of the things that you would love to be able to tell every single woman going through it? Wellness nugget, mm -hmm. something that you could pass on. When women get a cancer diagnosis, while you're treating them, after you're treating them, every little twinge, every little bump, every headache, every stray hair makes them scared. And so then they're like, oh, am I becoming this high maintenance person? Am I going crazy? What's going on? And I want to say, you're normal. You're normal. You've had a cancer diagnosis. You know, you should be aware of your body, but don't let it consume you. If you have something that's concerning, you go in and you get it checked. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be nothing. But it doesn't make you crazy. It doesn't make you high maintenance. It makes you normal. That cancer diagnosis changes you. But what it should not do is it should not define you. It should not control you, control your life. Saw a gal this morning, and she is bald as can be. I, I looked at her, and I said, you know, your hair does not define you. And she said, it doesn't. It doesn't. She's a strong woman, and she's going to get through this. Yes. You know, she will go on, and she will live her life. I love that. My patients are amazing, and people say, oh, you know, you give so much to your patients. No, my patients give. Patients. My patients give to me, and my life is so much richer because of them. The kind words, the thoughts, the looks, the hugs, the texts, the Christmas cards, they make my life so much richer. That's the best part of my job. That's also the worst part of my job. I love getting to know my patients and establishing that relationship. I love that they look to me for those honest answers and for me to take care of them, that they trust me and I do everything I can to, to earn it and to keep that trust. Uh, not only the patients that I see in clinic, but emails, the prescription refills, the paperwork that needs to be filled out. You know, you're getting paged. It's it, You go home and you're drained. Oh, and yeah. I go home and, and I unplug. And so, you know, people are like, oh, you know, do you want to go out? And no, no, I don't really. I want to <laughs> just go home and lay in the bed and have the cats come lay on top of me and have my husband bring me some food, yep, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I love that you've identified <laughs> what recharges you, too. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. How to yes. unplug, how yeah. to uh, recharge so that you can be yeah. the same great doctor that you are to them and, and maintain those relationships. Yeah. And, you know, my patients don't always do well. And, and that can be really, really hard. When I was struggling with this, somebody once said to me, well, what kind of doctor do you want to be? Do you want to be a doctor that distances yourself from your patients so that when bad things happen, you're not so hurt by it? Right. Or do you want to extend yourself to them down the road? You might be the one that hurts. And so that was the decision I made. Do you think a successful doctor can do it unattached? Well, depends on how you define success. Did you touch their body and heal their cancer? Yes. Can you do that by being detached? Yes. But did you also touch their heart? Did you make them smile? Did you touch their spirit? That's success too. Yeah. If that is your definition of success, do you feel you're successful? I do. I do. I know that was a hard one because usually it's really hard to take a compliment. We can look at ourselves and peel back the stuff that we're insecure about and look at our good qualities. But sometimes it's a little harder to then, yep, I do have that good quality and have <laughs> other people know it and be public about it. So yesterday was wife of a patient and she said, oh, you know, she said, thank you for being such a good daughter. And she went on to say some nice things. And I immediately turned into like an awkward 12 year old. <laughs> And I was like, uh, 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 yep. okay, <laughs> thank you, right? I, I do my best to try to do the right thing to treat their cancer, but I also try to take care of them as a person, too. The person behind the lab coat, 
mm-hmm. the person behind the scrubs. Mm-hmm. And I've already seen you be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. My definition of strength actually is when you are vulnerable. Mm-hmm. It's usually the way we relate to people. You being able to open up and share just a piece of you like that uh, to patients and to colleagues, to people around you, that's successful, not just as a doctor, but as a human being and as a woman. I have learned as I've gone along uh, lots of times during the day, patients are in the building for another appointment. Maybe they're to see a medical oncologist and they'll say, you know, can I see her? Can she just come out and say hi? And I can't always. Mm -hmm. So if I'm with a patient or something, or I I can't always, but if I am not absolutely strapped down, I go out. And this is why, because I one time had a patient stop by to see me. I was probably charting whatever. And I'm like, no, you know, and I didn't go. And so then I felt guilty about that. Not very long after that, I thought, you know what, I'm going to call. Then his wife answered, and she told me he had died. And one of the last things that he did was stop to say hi to me and to thank me for my help. And I started to cry, and I don't mean just cry. I mean, I was ugly crying. (laughs) It was ugly crying, big sobbing, racking after I hung up the phone. That was my lesson learned. Yeah. Um, I hope you've forgiven yourself because that's a human error changed you, even just that one small action. Yes, it has. And I think it's made me better for it. And I think that up above, he's looking down and he knows. Yeah. You know, I think he knows. So we talk about, you know, what advice would you give to women? I have several pieces of advice. Mm -hmm. Number one, women are usually in charge of their own health and of everybody else in the household. If there's going to be a caretaker, most times, who's taking care of mom and dad? Mm -hmm. So... Be aware of things that you can screen for. Women, get your mammograms. Mm. You know, tell your sisters, your friends, get your mammograms. I cannot stress that enough. Get your mammogram. Colonoscopies, Mm. you know, tests that's going to look for blood in your stool. Those are easy things to do. The fact of the matter is most cancers that are caught early are more likely to be cured. So let's be proactive about this, but not just cancer screening. So with your family, get your immunizations for your kids. Don't rely on herd immunity. People concerned about immunizations and side effects, those rare, rare occurrences Mm -hmm. of bad things happening are not as bad as if that kid catches polio. So get your screening, do your immunizations. You know, you should get regular physicals and take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Use some common sense. You know what they say about common sense? It's not that common. Get good sleep. Try to eat a healthy diet. Doesn't mean don't eat any sugar or it doesn't mean don't drink any alcohol. You do it in moderation, Mm -hmm. you know? So have some balance in your diet. Get good sleep. Exercise. Get up and move. You don't have to exercise seven days a week for an hour and a half each time. A couple days a week, you get up, you move, you go do something. It's good for you. The other thing is take care of yourself emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. That's something we don't always think about. If you're not right in your heart, if you're not right in your head, Mm -hmm. that's going to take its toll on everything else. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that you did bring that up. You don't expect your cancer doctor to be telling you to check in with your mental health. Mm -hmm. We see that that is one of the huge epidemics in our country right now. Now, is people not taking their mental health as seriously. I'm pleased to hear you make that part of your list of things that you need to do. It's a check-in. And I think you made a good point. Figure out what recharges you. Mm-hmm. You need to do that. So for me, go spend a couple hours at the cat's cradle and giving some love to those homeless cats. That recharges it. me. Being at home, uh, just in the peace and the quiet of my own home, that mm-hmm. recharges me. Taking a good nap, that recharges <laughs> me. So... When we talk myth busting, remember the game of telephone that we did when we were a kid? Yes. One person has the story and they share it with the next and the next person whispers it to the next and so on and so forth. And by the end of, let's say it's 20 people in line, the story is quite different. This is where myths kind of start to become. One person's experience then becomes the uh, the lesson or the rule. Correct. So what I love to have an expert in the seat in front of the microphone to actually bust some of these. We <laughs> use Google as our main doctor. Oh, Bert, I was going to say, Dr. Google. Dr. (laughs) Google, you tell me where he got or where he or she got their medical degree, because you be so careful. You go on Dr. Google and you don't know what you're going to get. There is a lot of information out there. Some of it is great. We have some good websites that we can recommend. You go on Dr. Google and who knows what you're going to get. And the other thing is people will say, oh, hey, I see that for cancer, I can get five treatments instead of 30 treatments and it's just as good and there's not a side effect. Okay, well, maybe they were talking about stage one and you're a stage 3B and you can't just expect. 
extrapolate and put those together. And so there's a lot of education that I think every medical professional does to fix Dr. Google. Yeah. And people try to self-diagnose by Dr. Google. Well, no matter what it is that I put in, whatever symptom, I've got cancer. Oh, yeah. That's well, crazy. <laughs> your mammograms mm-hmm. and stuff. There are women who are listening mm-hmm. that have, in fact, put that off because they look at it as, I did mine last year. It was all good. I can skip a year. I'm going to admit to you that I forgot my mammogram this year. I forgot my own mammogram. Oh, no. And I am really good about staying on top of things, but everything happened. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, well, then I went on my health and it said something about your report from your last mammogram in 2019. And I'm like, well, where's the report from my mammogram in 2020? And I was like, holy cow, do you not think that within 30 seconds I was on the phone? When can I get in for my mammogram? Point is, you can get busy. You can get deterred by things that are going on. You got to get your cancer screening because guess what? Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a cancer, you got to get your treatment. And so at Essentia, this is something, you know, that needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. So don't hesitate. Don't put it off. You got to go in and do it. It could save your life. The other question that I get from patients who are coming in is because when you start a course of radiation, usually it's for several weeks, it's Monday through Friday, it's best if you don't miss any. Mm-hmm. And well, what if I what if I get the Rona? What if I catch this awful coronavirus and it's so catchy and what can I do? Well, we're not excited about having coronavirus patients down in our oncology center where my patients are elderly. They're already compromised probably in their lungs or elsewhere, uh, and they're probably immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. Um, But we still want to give the correct care to our patients. So on the radiation oncology side, uh, if a patient is diagnosed, even while we're waiting for the testing results, we continue to treat them. Mm -hmm. We have a back door so that they're not walking in through the clinic they are, they are masked. They are, you know, appropriate PPE. We bring them in the back door. All doors are, are closed. Staff is wearing uber protective <laughs> PPE. We take them into the room. They get their treatment. They never go in the clinic. Uh, they are always scheduled as the last patient of the day. Um, and then that room is disinfected and left to sit until the next day. All right, let's shift gears a little tiny bit. What I was curious about because you've been so great about busting myths and giving some wellness nuggets here as we get to know you better. Um, is there any pet peeves that you have about oncology or, or people and cancer and what they think? So this really grates on my every nerve when, okay. when people say this, when they say, you know, there really could be a cure for cancer, but doctors don't want it to happen because they want to just keep making more money. Oh, so we do have a cure for cancer. We cure cancer every day. We have a cure for cancer. It's surgery. It's chemotherapy. It's immunotherapy. It's radiation therapy. We do have a cure for cancer. Number two, I'd gladly find another job. I'd gladly find another vocation, give my left arm. If there were some magic pill that we could all take and no one ever get cancer, Mm -hmm. I would do something else. So every once in a while, a patient will come up to me, maybe in follow-up or even if I see them out in the community, some event or whatever, and they'll say, Dr. Beekler, one time you said to me, and they will you know, give me the statement that I said, and it's just profound. And I was like, wow, I said that? (laughs) That's really good. And so, you know, by the time I've just about finished breaking my arm by patting myself on the back, I come to the realization, how many times did I say something that maybe had the opposite effect? Mm. That I said something carelessly or or that wasn't uplifting. Mm. And so, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Right, <laughs> you know, right. The song we used to sing in children's church. We have to be careful the things that we say in front of our patients, to our staff. Mm. You know, we're all a team. We all work together. You know, the team I work with, they're really good. And I, I would hope my patients are good, too, and realize that I have bad days, too. Yeah. I have bad days, too, where I've got family problems. Maybe I got a headache. Um mm-hmm. You are allowed to be human. I know. Thank goodness. (laughs) Thank goodness. We all are. We (laughs) we sometimes do need a bit of a reminder, though, that our doctors are human as well. Behind the stethoscope, the person behind the stethoscope. You know, doctors are, they are human. So there are some patients where you stand outside the door and you take a big breath in and and you go in. You still love them. You're Mm -hmm. still going to try to do the best you can for them. That's a small minority. With somebody with a cancer diagnosis goes through a surmountable amount of grief 
for themselves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And in that state, we oftentimes are just, we're oblivious to the things that are coming in and out of our ears. Oh, yeah. We're getting so much advice and so oh, much yes. protocol of do this, do this, do this, or this is what you'll have to do, et cetera. And to remember all of it isn't always easy. However, it's not the words that people necessarily say to you. It's how they made you feel, which is a Maya Angelou quote. Mm -hmm. And I found it to be just absolutely accurate in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And that's why I know that you're a good doctor because of the smiles and the laughs (laughs) and the making people feel good. You know, when I see people in a room and they're there with their spouse or their dad or whatever, uh, so many of them make the comment, I wish I could take this for them. I wish I could do this for them. They are affected too. And so sometimes, you know, say the patient steps out to use the restroom or something, then you take that opportunity to say to the wife, how are, how are you doing? Mm-hmm. Or how are your kids doing? Well, I'm worried because I'm old. I have my own health problems. How am I going to take care of him? I can't always give them the support that they need, but you know what? We've got cancer navigators. We've got mm-hmm. social workers. We've got dietitians, nurses. Uh, we've got a ton of people there who are going to help them. We can set them up to have someone to talk to, some kind of yeah. um, psychotherapist to help them through. It's not just the patients. It's the families. They need our care, too. So we're maybe not treating their cancer, but we're taking care of them, too. That's good. You're not the only rock star doctor Ah, that Essentia has, but you definitely, you're a gem in the crown and you're, you shine bright, honey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dare to ask questions. And I've actually heard women say, well, should I be concerned I have breast cancer if simply my boobs hurt and it's not my time of the month? Does that mean I have cancer? It doesn't mean you have cancer. It does not. It doesn't mean you doesn't, that you don't. Breast pain does not mean you have cancer, but it does not mean that you don't. Uh, When we see a breast cancer patient, we say, did you notice pain? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do. Usually they don't. Mm -hmm. You know, pain in the breast is usually something else, but it doesn't mean you don't get it checked. You get it checked. Okay. Yeah. So even when you've had some pain, it's good to call. It is good to call. (laughs) And stay away from Dr. Google. Yeah, my parting words of wisdom, stay away from Dr. Google. (laughs) Thank you. That's really good. I feel very humbled when when a patient makes the effort to go to somebody and say she did a nice thing or a staff, recognize that that it's not me, it's my nurse, Mm -hmm. it's my therapist, it's everybody that has done this for this patient or that patient's family or huge team approach it's it's not it's not one person it's usually uh, the mark of a good leader too Ah. to put the fingers back Ah. on everybody else in the team (laughs) 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 thank you so much dr joni beekler price oncologist at essentia health and we really just love that you spent this time with us today be good to yourself be kind to yourself be honest be real Dr. Joni Beekler Price, or as she told me to call her, Beekler. <laughs> she even leaves with sweet words like that. Just always so encouraging. And I hope she made you smile like she made me smile. All right, we have got one final episode left for season one of the Dare to Ask podcast. And this one is going to get you straight in the neck with Dr. Klug. It's coming up on the next Dare to Ask podcast. The information contained in this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for personalized professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The information is general in nature. If you have questions or concerns, please contact your provider.